another ancient uh, classical standard that Donatella revived was an equestrian statue. Uh, equestrian statues were not done throughout the Middle Ages, yet Donatello here builds the first one. It is in the, uh, the town of Padua. It's the same town of Padua where Giotto did his frescoes in the um, Arena Chapel or the Scrovegni Chapel. Uh, it is uh, the, the question statue of uh, a man called Gatta Milata. It is not a portrait. Gatta Milata, in fact, died long before. But uh, it portrays uh, the Renaissance uh, condottiero Erasmo de Narni, known as Gatta Milata, which is a haunted cat. Who knows what the, why that is. Uh, he served uh, mostly under the Republic of Venice, which ruled uh, Padua at the time. And as a result, Padua commissioned this uh, sculpture from Donatello, and Donatello spent some time in, uh, in Padua and, in fact, exercised an enormous uh, influence uh, on Padua, on the Vigneto in general, on, uh, on the city of Venice. Now, he had only one example, really, to look at. And that example was um, a classical, a Roman classical equestrian statue of uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, a Roman emperor of the end of the second century AD. It was very common with Romans to cast equestrian statues of, uh, of their gods, of their emperors, there were plenty of them. But um, with uh, the advance of uh, Christianity, uh, those sculptures, uh, those statues were considered pagan, those emperors were pagan, and bronze was very expensive, so they were all uh, melted down for the use in coins, for the use in uh, weaponry. Bronze was uh, a very, very expensive commodity, so it did not survive in its original form for the most part. Uh, with uh, very few exceptions, this being one of the greatest exceptions, and that is Marcus Aurelius, a question statue of Marcus Aurelius. And the reason it survived was because Christians thought it was Emperor Constantine. And um, Emperor Constantine was the first uh, Roman emperor to accept Christianity. In fact, he converted on his deathbed, but even before that, his mother, St. Helena, was a Christian, we're talking about the early 4th century AD, so a thousand years prior. Um, and, uh, and as a result, uh, Constantine himself was very tolerant of Christianity, in fact not only tolerant but encouraging of Christianity. It was under Constantine that uh, uh, the first uh, Christian basilicas, the first Christian churches were constructed both in Palestine and uh, in Rome. Because Marcus Aurelius uh, sported a beard, Romans usually didn't. Romans, for the most part, were clean-shaven, but Marcus Aurelius uh, was very enamored of Greek philosophy and everything Greek, in fact, uh, and Greek adult males had, uh, had beards, only youths did not. Um, so Marcus Aurelius grew a beard, and then Constantine the Great, who will ultimately move the capital of Rome to Constantinople, and will be exposed to uh, Greek culture, also wore a beard. But the Christians confused Marcus Aurelius and uh, Constantine. They felt this was Constantine, and because they felt this was the first Christian emperor, they did not destroy the sculpture. Uh, which is very good for us and was also very good for Donatello. However, with the sculpture of Marcus Aurelius, there's still a slightly different scale applied to horse and rider. Uh, because since, again, 5th century BC, uh, a convention was established where a horse was done on a small, smaller scale than the rider, so more equestrians could be fitted in, into a relief because a horse takes a lot of space, a lot more space than the, than the rider, but by making the horse smaller you can fit more horses together. So, but that convention was established and continued throughout 
uh, and here, even though we don't notice it at first, however, when you look at Marcus Aurelius' feet, they hang low, quite low below the his charger's uh, belly, whereas here, when you look at Gatta Milata, uh, this is a full, huge uh, size charger. And even though the rider perhaps is not of a uh, small size either, however, his feet, as you see, are barely reach uh, the belly of the horse and uh, he's not even portrayed, I mean he's portrayed as seated but it almost looks as if he's standing. Marcus Aurelius here wears uh, a civilian toga, he is not wearing his armor and he conducts his horse by his will as you see and his hand is extended in a gesture of benevolence because originally under the hoof of the horse lay uh, a figure of a barbarian and a Germanic barbarian uh, because uh, Rome was at that point already fight, fighting to preserve its borders against uh, the uh, Germanic tribes up north and uh, Marcus Aurelius extends his arm, his hand in the uh, gesture of forgiveness. Um, and thus Donatello had an example to go by, except he did not wish to have uh, different scales. He now portrays horse and rider on the same scale. Also, this man is a condottiere, which is a mercenary military commander. And as a military commander, uh, Donatello dresses him in, uh, in a sort of... Um, uh, mix of uh, uh, Roman military garb and Renaissance contemporaneous military garb. He also establishes this, this very tense diagonal between uh, the general's baton and his sword, as you see here. So he just gives it this geometrical determination, which is quite brilliant. Of course, the view changes as one goes around. Uh, but the best view is from the side, as I'm showing you. Uh, he also creates uh, these, um, he also creates, creates con uh, consecutive arches on his statue. There's an arch of the, uh, of the neck of the horse, the arch of the flank of the horse, the arch of the tail, and the tail is uh, terminated again with this knot that we saw on the tunic of St. George because Donatello always conveyed the tensions any which way he could and, uh, and the tied up uh, knot is, uh, is always uh, a good vehicle to do so. There's also another arch as you see right here and the horse's hoof is resting on a cannonball instead of a defeated foe. Uh, the, um, so this horse has four points of stability, which of course is the best way, uh, uh, because a number of horses were done with three points of stability. In fact, today, Marcus Aurelius' horse has three points of stability, one, two, three. I mean, obviously, they are attached to, uh, to the ground, but still. Uh, and uh, they used to have four when a uh, barbarian lay there, but no longer. And there are very, very few examples of uh, a rearing horse in sculpture because that would be, uh, that would require a great deal of balancing. As I said, uh, the face is, uh, it's not a portrait. Donatella never knew the man who had died earlier, but it is definitely a portrait of somebody. Uh, what Donatella needed was a very determined, very powerful, strong face and strong face we have, the very, this very strong chin, uh, exposed forehead, uh, um, projecting brow, the sunk eyes, uh, a face full of determination. As such, it became the first equestrian statue of the Renaissance, right here. Uh, the statue of Marcus Aurelius, well, today it is inside in the museum, but for centuries, it sat on top of the Capitoline Hill, and today we have a copy of it, right here. And here is uh, the difference, or the comparison, 
of the two, as you see. Marcus Aurelius is uh, wearing his uh, civilian uh, garb, whereas uh, Gatta Milata is in his uh, military uh, getup. However, just as is the case with Marcus Aurelius, Gatta Milata also conducts this enormous charger by the strength of will. As you see, his uh, stirrups do not touch the body of the horse, and the reins are slack. So, he does conduct the horse, just as Marcus Aurelius does, by the force of will. And now we go to architecture. Uh, we looked at sculpture, we go to architecture. In classical Greek architecture, there were three basic types of architectural orders. One is called the Doric order, second the Ionic order, and third the uh, Corinthian order. And here's the difference. The Doric order came first and Greeks loved Doric best. The Doric order consists of a column or a shaft that is fluted. In other words, it is grooved and the grooves meet at the relatively sharp angle right here. It sits directly on the ground. It has no base. For a capital here, that's the capital, it just uses a very plain stone pillow, unadorned. And then its frieze consists of these designs. Uh, uh, it is, uh, in the middle there is a flat space called the mitope, and then uh, the three groove uh, elements that are called triglyph. Triglyph, three glyphs, three groups. Uh, two immediately visible and half of each on the side. Most probably the style goes back to wooden architecture and when uh, we think of uh, wooden houses today and the construction of the roof, uh, then the beams project. They project and then, uh, and then the ceiling of the attic is placed on them. They also, and then the ceilings are based against them from the bottom. But these, uh, um, these beams project and that's what this probably refers to. These projecting beams because the temples, original Greek temples, were built of wood. But then with time they began to be built of stone. But now that the feature became stylistic, uh, perhaps they wish to imitate it as these triglyphs. But in the middle there is an empty space, a flat space. So thus Doric architecture. Then the Ionic order that followed the Doric order is a more elegant order. Doric is usually very um, uh, muscular, very uh, staunch, uh, very powerful and often quite short. However, the Ionic order is usually taller. It acquires a base. The column itself now sits on a base. The grooves on the column, the, uh, the flutes, now do not meet at a sharp angle, but they meet at a sort of a, at a fillet, at a flat fillet right here. Now, the capital acquires the look of uh, ram's horns, perhaps, I mean, I, ultimately, most of the architectural elements are taken from nature. And then uh, the Greeks who loved to decorate uh, their temples. But here they could decorate metopes one after another as, say, separate leaves in a book. They wished a continuous decoration. So they abandoned the triglyphs and introduced a continuous frieze, where they can do sort of a film decoration. And then the third is the Corinthian order, which is essentially identical to the Ionic order except for the capital. And even the capital has some remains often of the Ionic, uh, Ionic order right here. You see those volutes, the ram's horns. But uh, otherwise, the Corinthian capital is based on, uh, on a plant that grows all around the Mediterranean. It's called uh, the acanthus plant. And that plant was considered very beautiful. 
and uh, the leaves of that plant were stylized and used in the Corinthian order. Here we have it. This is Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. In the Doric order, as you see, very plain uh, capital, and then the triglyphs and the tops and the tops would be decorated. Here, the Ionic order, the column now sits on a base. The grooves you see have little fillets in between them. Here they don't. The capital is ram's horns and there's a continuous frieze. And then finally the Corinthian order, right here, the same column as the Ionic order. Then here we have these leaves, the acanthus leaves, and then frieze can be decorated in the same fashion as the Ionic frieze. Um, this is the great temple of uh, Parthenon in Athens, in Greece, and it is a Doric temple. So as you see, the nitops and triglyphs here, this is all that's left of it. And then the flutes uh, that meet at an angle and they sit directly on the ground on the style of it. Here is the Ionic order. Here is our base here, the capitals. It's a taller, more elegant order, shall we say. And here's the continuous frieze. And finally the Corinthian order. Greeks didn't really care much for the Corinthian order, but Romans loved it. Romans uh, used the Corinthian order everywhere. Now these are important to remember because uh, Renaissance architecture will uh, wholesale be using uh, classical orders and uh, it's important to distinguish the Doric order from the Ionic order from the Corinthian order. But now we come, we, we're still in Florence and uh, here's our baptistry right there. We had just uh, in the previous uh, lecture we covered the baptistry and its doors and uh, now we come to the cathedral itself. The Florentine cathedral as we see it uh, was began in uh, the year approximately just before the year 1300 and it was a Gothic cathedral. Uh, well Italy never really accepted Gothic because uh, classical Gothic uh, requires uh, the solving of walls and the Italians love their walls. Uh, they, keep the, they kept them warm in the winter, they kept them cool in the summer plus they loved decorating their walls, they loved their frescoes. And uh, so when Gothic came to Italy, it came transformed and mostly uh, it came to the north of Italy, well Milan of course, because Milan was uh, under the influence of uh, the French and Gothic was born in France. But the further south it went, uh, the lesser uh, Gothic we see. Florence, however, built their cathedral in this new style that was considered a new style at the time, which was Gothic style. Uh, here we see it. Now, when we see the cathedral, uh, we, we should remember that the facade actually was not built until the 19th century. So it stood before uh, the 19th century without the facade. They also, they also made this enormous basilica and the, at the end of the basilica, where the so-called transept uh, was, the crossing of the transept and the, and the nave, which was octagonal, they made it extremely large, huge. Right here, as you see, they're, they're just, it consists of four very large bays. The walls are certainly not dissolved, and the large pillars are holding, holding up the weight of the cathedral, pointed arches right here in the four bays, and then pointed lancets at the end of, um, of the apse. All of these are Gothic features. Uh, they are more decorative features than structural features, but Gothic nevertheless they are. So over there, as you see, that opening, and it is an octagonal opening, was so large, no one knew how to cover it. No one knew how to build a dome so massive and uh, that, that could in fact uh, exist without collapsing. There were all sorts of theories. There were even theories of uh, building um, uh, a landmass, uh, building a huge uh, earth hill in the middle 
uh, with uh, silver coins inside so that the earth hill would be used as scaffolding to build the, the dome itself and then in order to remove all that earth because there would be silver coins inside the population would be very eager obviously to participate so there were all sorts of projects uh, but in the end no one knew how to do it until until Brunelleschi lost uh, to Ghiberti his um, the, the, uh, the baptistry competition now Brunelleschi's loss for, became our gain well he is ultimately also because uh, very upset about the loss he took himself off to Rome perhaps with his friend Donatello and in Rome uh, as opposed to studying sculpture as Donatello did he began to study architecture and um, as I had mentioned earlier uh, a renaissance uh, master craftsman, a, a renaissance artist was uh, extremely versatile, extreme, extremely multitasking. He could do anything. He could do sculpture, he could do architecture, he could paint, uh, he was a scientist, uh, uh, he was a geologist, he, was, uh, he could be a geographer, uh, he could be anything, in other words. Uh, a military engineer, and uh, so Brunelleschi switched to architecture and uh, one building in particular that interested him in Rome most avidly was uh, a building called the Pantheon, not the Parthenon that we saw uh, as an example of um, a Doric order, but Pantheon, the temple of all gods that still exists in Rome. It's probably one of the best preserved uh, antique uh, classical buildings in existence and it survived because it was turned into a Christian church and Pantheon has an extraordinary dome and uh, so Brunelleschi in fact went crawling all over that dome trying to figure out how it was done of course that dome actually was done with the help of cement which uh, principle was lost uh, and will not be discovered until considerably later. And uh, so Brunelleschi was, co was faced with uh, uh, having to deal with masonry or with bricks. And uh, he ultimately built his dome. Of necessity, uh, the dome still has Gothic features because it had to follow the octagonal opening of the cross section of the cathedral. But the principle itself of its building is so advanced that the principle itself is Renaissance principle. The engineering of that dome is um, unimaginable. In fact, uh, no one would know how to do something like that uh, in the Renaissance. This was beyond his times entirely because what he will do ultimately is create, uh, create two shells one shell done of masonry inside and another shell done of uh, tiles on the outside. Inside with masonry and brick and then the two shells together would be attached to one another through numerous buttresses that were built between them and then the brick would also be arranged as a herringbone which also sustained itself. It's difficult to convey uh, if, if if you're interested, there is a, there's a lovely book uh, called Brunelleschi's Dome, which explains it in detail. So here it is, and not only the scheme itself was uh, ingenious, but it required no scaffolding. And that was the most ingenious of all. Because in fact, uh, when the first stone was laid uh, sometime in 1296, 97, it seems the city of Florence also planted a grove of trees that would serve uh, as uh, scaffolding whenever someone appeared who would know how to do it. Well, he did build his dome and uh, this dome uh, became this symbol of Florence. In fact, uh, traditional uh, native Florentines would always tell you that they were born under the shadow of the Duomo. The, the, the cathedral itself came to be known as the Dome, the Duomo. Uh, Brunelleschi, when he built the Dome, left this, uh, this seam unfinished, the seam between the drum and the Dome itself, 
And then sometime uh, at the end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century, somebody came up with this idea of doing this, this colonnade. But the colonnade is of such trivial scale that it just doesn't go with the magnificence of the um, dome itself, with the magnificence of the cathedral and uh, uh, Michelangelo, when, when, when this was finished, uh, called it the cage for crickets. Uh, so it was, never, it was never continued. And as such, the dome until today uh, stands with the seam, that large portion, unfaceted by stone. We will uh, talk uh, about uh, Michelangelo soon enough and uh, and his sculpting of David, perhaps, uh, perhaps you know that sculpture. Uh, the sculpture was meant, in fact, to uh, be placed on top of the cathedral, because just as sculptures decorated the bottoms of the buildings, they also decorated the tops of the building, as with Orsan Michele in those niches, but also on top the buttresses. In many Italian cathedrals have sculpture, and David was commissioned to be one of them. This is an installation because we don't know exactly where he was meant to be. So this is the cathedral and there's David. It's just that when he was sculpted, uh, he was so beautiful. The Florentines simply didn't have the heart to place him up on top and uh, so he was placed in, uh, in front of, uh, of Palazzo Vecchio, of their, of their civic center. Brunelleschi projected the lantern. He died before uh, before the entire dome was completed. So his follower, Michelozzo, uh, another brilliant architect, uh, built, uh, finished the lantern according to Brunelleschi's designs. And even though the general appearance of the lantern is still uh, sort of gothic in the sense that um, it looks like a steeple, but the elements, all the elements on that lantern are very Renaissance already, and uh, particularly the scrolls, the uh, the arches, the Corinthian pilasters. The difference between a Corinthian column and a Corinthian pilaster: a column is round, and uh, a pilaster is a square relief of a column in a sense. Here, there are the pilasters. You see, it's not a freestanding column. And, uh, but the uh, capital is Corinthian. So these are Corinthian pil pilasters and they are folded around the corners of the, uh, of the lantern. And then the scrolls, here they are. These scrolls are very Renaissance scrolls as well as the niche itself right here. Because on the cathedral itself, on the dome itself, let me look at it, oh, here. The dome itself, as I said, the Brunelleschi had to follow the original design and had to follow ostensibly Gothic uh, decorative principles. But he was nevertheless capable of introducing some Renaissance uh, elements, even in the uh, in the in the dome structures. Well, right here, uh, these excedras right here are also quite Renaissance, with. Um, rounded arches and the proportions and harmonies of, um, uh, of Renaissance architecture. So here you see it, but also in the, uh, in the lantern. Uh, inside the cathedral is not nearly as beautiful as the Sienese cathedral, but of course it is quite magnificent nevertheless. Uh, the, uh, the dome is stupendous. And here it is, you see the seam right there that had not been finished. Oh, and here is the etc. with its Renaissance niches. The concomitant project that Brunelleschi also undertook uh, at the same time was the building of an orphanage. Uh, there were many, many orphans in uh, Florence. They were called Innocenti, and as a result, the Florentine uh, telephone book, well, when they printed telephone books, uh, one third of it had the name of Innocenti in it. And um, the building is called today the Hospital of the Orphans, or the Ospendali degli Innocenti, which um, Brunelleschi began in um, 1419. And here he could truly, truly exercise um, what he had learned in Rome of the Renaissance principles, 
which, remember, he could not entirely uh, exercise uh, with the Duomo. He created a loggia right here, consisting of these beautiful round arches and the pedimental windows above. Pedimental because this triangle above a window is called a pediment. And uh, what is uh, extraordinary about the building also is that is that the proportions, the harmonies, the one to two, two to three, three to four modules were used or with the with consistency, uh, and as such, each of these arches right here, the arch itself is half a circle but then the height of the column, the width between the columns and the distance between the column and the wall are all the same. So as a result, each space, each bay represents a, perf it represents a cube with, uh, with this cubic vault above it, which is uh, beautiful, very consistent, very classical, very stable modules. Uh, the, uh, and you can see it here, so this height, this distance, and then the distance between the columns, they are all the same. So these are all cubes, and you see, as you see. Now, when you see these rods, and uh, even when uh, you, or perhaps you have traveled to Italy, perhaps you've seen these rods, these are tying rods, actually, because um, in Gothic architecture, uh, the taller the building was and the higher the groin vaults, the heavier they were, very, very heavy. And as you can imagine, just having the two walls and then a vault, where, whether the, the vault is the Gothic vault or a barrel vault, very heavy, it's masonry vaults. And the, uh, these vaults push down and make the walls, well, fall apart if uh, the walls are not thick enough or don't have enough supports. So Gothic architecture, because they wanted very thin walls just so they could cut them for windows, they devised a system of flying buttresses. The buttresses that, uh, that in fact su supported the wall so it doesn't fall down under the weight of the, uh, of the vaulting. But the Italians hated these buttresses. They felt that, in fact, it was the Italians uh, who called the style Gothic, which is a misnomer, because uh, Italians felt that only barbarian Goths could come up with such uh, uh, visually defective architecture. But uh, Gothic style, in fact, was born in the uh, early 12th century in Paris. Uh, but uh, so Italians didn't like it, but they still needed for these walls to be uh, stable. So as a result, they introduced, they felt that these tie rods, these metal tie rods that actually connected the walls together were uh, a better, had a better, better visual effect than the flying buttresses. And that's why you will see these uh, uh, tie rods in, uh, in a number of uh, Italian buildings. So this Ospendale degli Innocenze was uh, a, a great uh, example of uh, Brunelleschian architecture. Uh, there's a film called Tea with, with Mussolini that was made in 1999 and it is semi-biographical, semi-autobiographical film directed by Franco Zeffirelli about his youth in Florence and Franco Zeffirelli, who died just recently, I think at the age of 100, was um, a great uh, cinema director, opera director, a designer, a great artist. Uh, and this film actually has share in it, which is brilliant, with all and uh, a number of those English dames. Uh, it's a brilliant film and it shows the, uh, uh, the orphanage in the film because the young boy, young Zaffirelli, presumably was in fact uh, a denizen of this, um, of this place. Civic architecture also became very important, uh, domestic architecture. And um, the, uh, the example that will be followed uh, for century afterwards 
not only in Italy but elsewhere as well, including America, is uh, the building that was built for the Medici family. It was built for the founder of the family, Cosimo de' Medici, back in the uh, middle of the 15th century, and it was built by Michelozzo, the same man who finished the lantern on the, um, on the Florentine Cathedral. The building is called today Palazzo Medici Ricardi because at first it was uh, the Medici mansion and then, uh, and then uh, the Ricardi family bought it later, so it's called the Medici Ricardi. Um, the Michelozzo built it on the commission from the Medici and became a prototype of Renaissance civil architecture. What is um, very interesting, what is very important uh, about this building is particularly the first floor because uh, what Michelozzo did, he, um, he looked back again at classical uh, structures, particularly classical Roman structures as opposed to the Greeks. The thing with the Romans is that they were extremely practical. While the Greeks appreciated aesthetics, and they certainly were aesthetes, Romans uh, were not really intellectuals or aesthetes. I mean, they'll try once, once they were exposed to Greek culture. They, um, they'll put on aesthetic airs as well. But the Romans basically were very uh, practical, very pragmatic people, where Romans achieved greatness was not in an ideal uh, uh, human body, was not in uh, calculating the uh, celestial uh, harmonies as the Greeks did. They achieved uh, lasting importance through their practical matters, and that is building bridges, building roads, and the most importantly, uh, codifying the uh, Roman law, upon which, in the end, uh, Napoleonic code was based, uh, and uh, and even contemporary law is based, uh, certainly in Europe, and in our case, Louisiana and um, Quebec, and even English law that uh, that is common law, nevertheless looked. Uh, very carefully at the Roman law. So Romans were very practical people and uh, they also loved hygiene. Uh, they, uh, they bathed several times a day and for that purpose they built uh, an enormous amount of baths everywhere they went and these baths required clean water and for the clean water they built the aqueducts that delivered clean water from springs outside large cities and the majority of these aqueducts were um, operated by gravity. And the majority of them were built underground. However, however when, uh, when the ravines or rivers had to be passed, that's when bridges were built, which also served as aqueducts, duct conducting aqua water. And this is one of the um, famous Roman aqueducts. It is uh, located in the south of France and it's called Pont du Gard. It is a tremendous structure. The, um, the water was sent through the channels up above, but otherwise it served as a bridge. It still serves as a bridge. And what the Romans did on the surface was um, use the so-called rusticated design. They did not care to cover these structures with uh, polished stone or even less so with very expensive marbles. They wanted this rough rusticated style because for one thing it, uh, it conveyed uh, the uh, unstoppable determined Roman will that ultimately conquered the entire Mediterranean area. But also it was very convenient for scaffolding because scaffolding was much easier to be attached to something rough like this than to something, to a polished marble or polished anything for that matter. And, um, and these aqueducts and in fact uh, uh, the, the bridges as well of course as part of them were very closely guarded 
and uh, once, once in a while, well, always were repaired, uh, always kept in a state of repair because uh, the cities depended on that water for their daily life. Well, Michelozzo adopted that rustication to his uh, Medici Palazzo and the first story, as you see, gives this impression of uh, strength, of might, of uh, stubbornness. Uh, and the Medici family ultimately will rise to become the number one uh, family of Florence but, and with time of Italy, really, it is to the Medici, ultimately, that we owe great works of Renaissance. Uh, uh, it was the Medici who paid uh, Brunelleschi for the cupola of uh, Florence. It was the Medici who commissioned Donatello uh, to cast the statue of David. It was the Medici whose money supported the arts of the city consistently. Uh, again, if you're interested, uh, there is a series called the Medici uh, Kings of Florence, Rulers of Florence, uh, on, uh, on Netflix, and it's very well done as well. And you can see a number of buildings there and, uh, and the methods uh, applied. Uh, so here it is. That's the first story of the building. And then the rustication uh, gets smoothed out as um, the building rises. And uh, as the building rises... Uh, uh, the second story, and this is the story where the family lived, you see that masonry is still very much uh, uh, visible, and it is, uh, the, mason, the uh, blocks themselves are separated by grooves right here, and then the arch is built over the, uh, the double window, and then it becomes smoother yet and, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the last story. The cornice is very uh, much projected because uh, these were difficult times and very often the population of Florence would rise and the Medici of course being so powerful had their enemies and uh, this palazzo was also a fortress as uh, were a number of buildings uh, during the, um, the Renaissance as in fact the Sistine Chapel in Rome uh, was also. Uh, it was the chapel, but at the same time it was a fortress and built by a military engineer. But again, as I said, uh, these artists, whether artists, uh, whether sculptors, whether architects, they were also military engineers and botanists and geologists. Uh, they were everything. Um, inside, however, inside the building, there is a beautiful, beautiful uh, courtyard that is done in the style of uh, Brunelleschi. In fact, the, uh, the Medici, Cosimo de' Medici, at first wished for Brunelleschi to build his, um, uh, his palazzo, but it seems that Brunelleschi's design was uh, a little too luxurious. And because Florence was still a republic, at least in name, uh, Cosimo de' Medici felt that he did not wish to, to flaunt his wealth and the Michelozzo design was more acceptable. But once inside the palace, then of course this is private property and one can do as one like. It is inside this courtyard that um, David, uh, the Donatello's David, originally was placed. And uh, just the entire house was filled with the most magnificent works of um, 15th century Renaissance. Uh, uh, Today, today it's still a beautiful place to visit, even though most of the art collection is in uh, various museums. Well, um, we have come to the end of, uh, of, the, of our lecture, and I will see you soon. Thank you.